Welcome back to Eye on Health with Dr. Michael Jones. All right, welcome back. Thanks for hanging on through the break. This is Eye on Health. Every Saturday, 10 to 11, we're talking about your health, sometimes your insurance, sometimes technology. And once again in studio, we have Dr. Joe Ogile from the Clayton Sleep Institute. Point of order. Yes. ICD-10 code of the week, anything? Don't push me Okay, on. sorry. All right, I'll leave it. He is real. Dr. Listen, Joe can normally attest. Normally, we don't make it till the third segment with that. <laughs> do, do they have one on for, for delivery of the fourth child? <laughs> oh, <laughs> look yeah, it up. I'm yeah. sure they do. Sure yeah. I thought that's there. what you were going to pull out. Well, yeah. We've got something here, but we've got more important things to we talk do. about. We do. There's callers. We have lots of callers lined up to ask Dr. Joe about sleep problems. So let's get to some of your calls. Okay. We've got Jerry on line one. Jerry, what's your question for Dr. Ojo? Uh, well, I have a lot of uh, issues trying to sleep. Um, I'm only probably about 10 pounds overweight. I don't know that it's uh, sleep apnea. Obviously, it could be from hearing the conversation. But I think it started uh, when I had uh, tonsil count cancer about 10 years, 12 years ago. And on the right side of my neck had a radical uh, neck dissection. So I couldn't snore if I wanted to. <laughs> um, but... Uh, you know, I've tried a lot of different sleep aids, sleeping pills, and they tend to work for two or three nights. And then, again, you know, I wake up at 3.30, my mind just thinking about all kinds of things and just can't get back to sleep. So, you know, I'm normally lucky if I get, you know, five, six hours sleep. Jerry, are you tired during the day? Uh, sure. When I, on those uh, nights when I don't get sleep, yeah, you bet. Falling asleep and... And so forth, or you just feel crummy? Oh, just feel crummy, yeah. Okay. Like I got the flu or something. I don't, you know, I don't nod off. Okay. Anymore. Well, thank you for sharing your story. And I hope that your head and neck cancer is much improved or cured. And yep. th there's your story is not uncommon. And I'm glad you pointed out because all of sleep medicine is not sleep apnea. So I'm, I'm delighted that you you have several things. Uh, there's a couple things about your your history and story that are quite um, interesting. The fact that you had that uh, head and neck surgery. Did you have radiation, Jerry, as well? Yes, radiation did. Okay. and chemo. Yes, sir. So that the surgical changes in your back of your throat, your jaw and so forth, and neck can play a role in uh, altering the anatomy as well as the radiation. So there is the possibility that you have this underlying low-grade, what we call sleep-disordered breathing, whether it's sleep apnea or not, where you actually stop breathing is unclear. That can contribute to some of your symptoms. However, your description of not being able to, of waking up, the medicine's not working for but a few days, and uh, not being able to turn your brain off, I suspect you're solving all the world's problems, and we really appreciate you helping us. But, <laughs> but in the morning, they continue to be there, and so... Can we get him on the government payroll? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, what we, what we suggest, and then this was was described very well by the National Institute, Institute of Health um, consensus conference in 2005 on insomnia therapy is you need uh, more than likely some con some comprehensive sleep behavior care. We have sleep behavior people who will sit and talk to you about all the aspects of your sleep and give you strategies. Actually, te sleep can be learned how to start and go to sleep and how to handle that during the night. So that's it's called behavioral intervention, some some behavioral therapy. Um, if Depending on how it's done, it can even be called cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's very effective. Uh, nothing's, of course, 100%, but it's, it's quite effective, and it'll give you the skills, hopefully, to both get to sleep now, and then if this happens again, say in three to five years, it'll allow you to be able to do the same behavior. So the goal here is, if you remember the old biblical tale, um, instead of giving you a fish, teach you how to fish. And wow. so I, it sounds to me like that's at least partially something that's missing. Now, is that type of therapy also covered by insurance? Yeah, it, yes, it usually is. And so and it, and it, it just involves visits to the office. Um, as far as the, any, the, the insomnia and the behavioral therapy, there's, no, there's not any nighttime testing that's involved. Gotcha. Jerry, thanks for your call. Yeah, Thank thanks you so much, Jerry. <clears throat> Before we go to the next caller, he brought up a couple of good points. 
and I'm sure this is the most common thing, I think his sleep problems were multifactorial, yes. right? It wasn't just a physical obstruction, but also he couldn't turn his brain off type of thing. That was one point. So great, great question, Jerry. And then one other thing I noticed, nowhere in your answer did you say we need to dope you up on medicine to try to get you to sleep. And I think you've talked about that before. These mm-hmm. behavior modifications may work better. They do. And then, well, and the other thing is we what we tell patients is we're, we're, ag- we're agnostic about medicine. If they need it, we want to use it as part of the solution, but not usually for the complete solution and not long-term. Great. Next up, we've got Susie on line three. Susie, uh, well, what's your question for Dr. Ojo? Hi. Um, I do have sleep apnea, and I was um, tested at Clayton Sleep Institute by another physician, and um, they discovered that I was I stopped breathing 27 times every hour, so that, <laughs> that was a, um, a, <laughs> a red flag for me. So I am on CPAP. I've been on CPAP for about nine months now, and I love it. Um, I found uh, a couple really good things about it. One is that I have not had one single incident of um, acid reflux since I've been on CPAP. And the other thing, besides the fact that I'm sleeping, is that my husband is also sleeping, which is a (laughs) wonderful thing. Um, But my real question for you is, we are preparing to take a trip, a two-week trip to Ireland in June. And I'm planning to take only one small carry-on bag, and I don't see how my CPAP is going to fit. Um, I've seen some on the Internet, some very small versions of it, but they're quite expensive. And I'm wondering if uh, an anti-snore uh, appliance made by my dentist would get me through the two weeks that we are overseas. Well, uh, you, you, there's, thank you for calling yeah, in. Yeah, that's and a great question, Joe. Is. I've been wondering the same thing. How do you travel with these things? So that's know? awesome. And, and first of all, thank you. I hope you had a great experience at, at, at the sleep lab. Um, with my colleagues and uh, appreciate you uh, going through the process and being positive and optimistic about your therapy because that that attitude will translate into into better outcomes. Um, On the specific questions, there's a couple things. One, snore guards typically won't fix your sleep apnea. They may make you stop snoring. Um, Some people will actually purchase through their dentist the actual oral appliance that you use for obstructive sleep apnea, and that is a solution. But if it's only for two weeks this one time it's a it's somewhat of an expensive solution the the smaller machines they're the most the probably the one of the best ones that's out right now um and this isn't any sort of endorsement it's just one that's quite popular and, and we've seen good success with it it's what's called the transcend and it's about five hundred dollars i think um and and it's does not have a humidifier so that's one thing if you can get by without the humidifier some of these smaller devices are available but here's one other solution that we have not talked about there's a thing called nasal valves what they look like is they're small band-aids um, that fit on your nostrils. They're one-way valves. So when you breathe in, it pressurizes the back of your throat, and it's <laughs> it, it does the same thing as CPAP. So they're, they're, they're FDA-approved but not covered by insurance typically. Um, the original name was ProVent, if you want to look it up on the Internet, ProVent. Um, there's, they're also called TheraVent. So um, they're available. We they're they're there to we have them there as a service for patients. And the most common time we see these used is for travel. Um, so they can be quite effective, and they can apply seven to nine centimeters of water pressure, uh, typically. Which I don't know what your uh, CPAP pressure is set at that we measure it in centimeters of water pressure. Do you happen to know? No. Okay. But the most common pressures are 6 to 10. So more than likely, this would be a a possible solution. And you might want to talk to your sleep doctor or to the respiratory therapist there at the sleep lab, and they can give you all the information uh, as well. And that that may be another opportunity where you wouldn't have to take your CPAP at all for those two weeks. Probably less expensive too, right? Yeah, quite inexpensive actually in comparison. Oh my gosh, that would be that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> Thank it. Thank you for your thanks kind for, thanks, call. Thanks for the yes. call, Susie. Yeah, what a great point. I've wondered that because this has got to come up all the time. It does. It comes up a lot. If you notice now, um, patients. First of all, if you go to the airport, they have a sign that says, "If you have CPAP, at security. If you have CPAP." Please put it on this part of the belt and whatnot. So the the, the screeners are used to seeing them. They're so common. Um, what patients tell me, and I, I don't, 
I apologize for not having official confirmation from the TSA, but evidently your CPAP device does not count as your carry-on. Oh, okay. All right. So you're not going to get charged extra for it. Th- that's what I've like been that. told. I, I, don't, I haven't heard that from the airline, but patients repeatedly have told me. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah. All right. We've got Tim on line two. Tim, what's your question for Dr. Ojal? Hey, Dr. Ojal. It's Tim, uh, one of your former patients. Uh, it was about, I want to say, 2000 and. Eight, I was at your clinic. Oh, great. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a while back. Uh, anyways, uh, you know, you're so kind enough to me. You uh, took me in. My mother, uh, I didn't have insurance at the time. I was poor and all that. But uh, you were my dad's former, uh, my dad was a former patient. Of oh, thank you, Tim. Uh, you were very kind to me and taking uh, pity on me. I didn't have any money or anything. But anyways, it's, I'll get to the point. Um, I weighed about 412 pounds. Uh, woke up more than a thousand times in the night, and wow. uh, you put me on a BiPAP machine. It works great. I've lost all the weight. I'm about 230 pounds right now, and oh uh, doing well. And congratulations! Uh, I actually achieved REM sleep, and uh, I- I'm not waking up maybe twice a night uh, due to my my baby just taking care of my baby. But uh, uh, that's normal. Uh, I am not having any trouble other than having a dry mouth occasionally. Uh, do you think I should stop using the bypass machine? Because I haven't used it in about a year now, and I haven't had any complications. So, so Tim, thank you that that thank you for such a, a really great um, his, history and story, and I want to congratulate you on on taking such a positive, proactive. Uh, part of your health um you've lost 200 pounds you lost an entire person and in, in weight so that's really <laughs> neat and that's that's we I, I will just share that the last these callers um we always tell people that they come in for us to lift them up they lift us up you inspire us to do our work every day and help um i, I would suggest especially with the congratulations of your new child uh probably a simple maybe home test to make sure that you do or don't have obstructive sleep apnea ongoing is a very easy cost effective way just to double check you do have that anatomy and that risk you probably have marked improvement in your sleep apnea but it'd be unsure just based on what you're saying if you have it or not so i think just to be safe especially for your long-term health and now that you're dad it'd be a good thing to do congratulations all right guys stay tuned more with dr joe ogile here on eye on health wow there's a time and place for everything With more Eye on Health with Dr. Michael Jones. You're killing me today, Eric. Hey, listen. I'm trying to give the listeners as much Dr. Jones and Dr. Ojal <laughs> as possible. Normally, I've got time to go take a break and get a drink. Not so. You're, you're killing me. One hour a week, Dr. What, Jones. What did I You were on my time. And it, it, that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> and of all the weeks... I'm running right. late. Dr. Ogile's here, and you're pushing me. Well, <laughs> Welcome back to Ion Health, twice. folks. This is almost like satellite radio. There's no commercials <laughs> yeah. here. This is great. What's that? I've never heard of it. Oh, yes, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got Dr. Jo- <laughs> we've got Dr. O- Joe Ogile from Clayton Sleep Institute talking about sleep and how it affects your health. We have had just some remarkable callers. So Wonderful great. calls. Thank and you. what's great about those calls, those are real world sort of things. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure if there's one caller, there's 10 other people who are having mm-hmm. the same experience. So thanks so much for the calls. We're coming to the end of the show here, but let's try to get to as many of these callers as we can. Yep, we've got Ron on line one. Ron, what is your question for Dr. Ojo? Uh, I've been on a CPAP machine for about six years. It's working fine. It does what it's supposed to do, but I really don't like the inconvenience of it. So I'd like to know about the the efficacy of these appliances that uh, you can use in your mouth. I see lots of them advertised now through dentists. They'll they'll make you one. I don't know what they know about it. 
Uh, I'm also was enchanted by the ProVent, and I'm wondering if that might be a, a possible solution for me full time. Uh, my sleep number, I think it's ten. Mm-hmm. And then I'd like to know whether or not this is covered by Medicare. And those are my questions. Great, th- they're great questions. <laughs> Thanks, and Ryan. It, was this a tr- truck driver? And- no, that's another question okay. coming so, up. Yeah. So th- there's several. Let me talk through the the, qu- the subjects quite quickly. Um, and this is a, a this is a very common reason for someone to come in and, and have a visit. By the way, sir. So thank you again. Um, one, the appliances can be very effective. We, especially if your your severity of sleep apnea is in the mild to moderate range, we actually talk to every patient if we can about that as an option. Uh, so patients have different goals. Um, usually, you want to have your teeth. So if if you have full dentures. Most of the appliances can't be used with the dentures from what my dental co- sleep colleagues will tell me. Um, we do have access to, to very good sleep dentistry or sleep dental care here in St. Louis. And so an evaluation is, is usually appropriate and helpful. Um, you should have a test done, even just a home test um, in the year prior to getting evaluated. They're going to want that data to, to assess your severity of your sleep apnea. Um, so you might be a candidate, but there's not enough information to know whether that would be the case. Um, at 10 centimeters of water pressure, the ProVent could be an option for you. But since it's not covered by health insurance, you end up having to buy it each month. And so you'll have to make that economic calculation um, as well. There was a third part to his question. I, I didn't I think you got them all. Medi- was it Medicare? Oh, Medicare. Oh, Medicare. Yeah. yeah right. and, uh, the, your dentist would work that out with you. But my understanding is that Medicare does cover um, the oral. They're called oral appliances or mouthpieces for some patients. So that is a conversation that you should have. So good, good luck, and if we can help, we're happy to, sir. Thank and you. Before we go to uh, Eric here, who has another question, not not this Eric. Uh, if you have a question, we've got a few minutes left in the show. We might be able to get one or two more in. Give us a call, 314-969-9797 or 866-455-9797. Uh, Eric, you are on the line with Dr. Ojal. What's your question? Thank you. Uh, I'm a truck driver. I'm six foot four, about um, everything between 375 and 400. Well, you know, I'm losing weight, but... Uh, Every time I get a DOT physical, they want to say I have sleep apnea. I have no problem sleeping. I never lose my breath or whatever when I'm sleeping. I, just, I sleep good. But the thing is, I don't sleep flat because I had a car accident and I hurt my back. And I lay flat. I can't sleep at all because my back hurts. So I sleep in a recliner. Okay. I was wondering why, no matter what, and just because you're big doesn't mean you have sleep apnea. Yeah, so let this is this is this also comes up commonly. And, and by the way, we're very thankful that you called in because this is an important subject. So, um, the for people who operate motor vehicles for a living, and, and actually anyone who operates a motor vehicle or heavy equipment, uh, generally safety is going to be a, a significant concern. So, what the examiners are doing, and they're they're under. Uh, they're under a lot of scrutiny. There's regulations and so forth out there that give guidance to this is they want to as as all of us as citizens in this in this together, because we're all on the roads together and so forth. Um, we're trying to improve safety. And so people that have high anatomic risk, that doesn't mean that you have it, just high anatomic risk. So if you're a, a male and you are over 17 inches in, around your neck, um, if you're um, body mass index, which is a combination or calculation from your height and weight. Some people will say over 30, some over 35. And if they look in your throat and you have a small throat, that would be considered high risk. So they're not necessarily trying to un- unpick on you in any way. They're just saying, okay, we need to make sure that this individual who's going to be operating some sort of motor vehicle, which effectively, if they fell asleep, would become a dangerous uh, event um, it doesn't have that, so it's it's to protect both you and the public. But wouldn't you think, rather than just telling him he has it, shouldn't they send them to someone like you so he can get to actually tested? They for do. It? They do. They no, do. no. Okay. So what happens is that 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 causes them to have to be evaluated by the, a sleep clinic or a sleep doctor, and so that's well, kind have, of the process. Well, if I have to go to sleep studies. Do I have to sleep in a bed or try to sleep in a recliner? Um, it, it depends. We have we do have some of that available or elevated beds. Um, so it depends. I have to have elevated. I can't. I, I cannot sleep at all laying flat in my okay. back. Because you have back, my knees start hurting. Yeah, so there there is the possibility. Yeah, there is the possibility of sleeping in a recliner. One last thing is 
people that have chronic pain are frequently on pain medications, and that actually can contribute to making sleep a- obstructive sleep apnea worse or cause another kind of apnea. So that's another reason to look at it, sir, as well. So yeah. you may you may not have anything wrong. I can't tell from your history and wouldn't dare say, but the I think in a, an evaluation would be helpful. That's a great, a great call. Yes, um, thank you. The, we get those calls all the time, and sometimes we don't have enough time to get to them. Mm-hmm. So a great call. But you're saying you normally would check someone flat, but if their normal sleep position is upright in a recliner, would you then do the test in that position? We will attempt to do that depending on the circumstance. He has a medical reason okay. that he can't lie down, okay. so that's a bit because. But we have people that have heart failure, things like that, that become quite physiologically complicated. So okay. we have to adapt to them. Well, thanks so much for coming in, Doctor Joe. It's always Thank interesting you. to have you in. We'll have you back again. Great, because it's you. fantastic. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll list. Uh, well, we'll yeah, we'll be here next week. Too. We'll be here next week. <laughs> thanks for the great questions. Yes, yeah. yeah. thanks. More at 971talk.com.